Open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, and we carry on our uh, discussion in the first chapter of the book of Ephesians, in which we will end uh, this chapter today, verses 19 through 23. And last week we looked at verses 15 through 19 and saw the beginning of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, and we were reminded about growth. We were reminded that uh, we must be growing, we must be learning, we must be seeking a goal of learning how to live each and every day with the gospel in mind. And we shared the covenant of this church from 1846 and saw that it was their goal to live with each other under the gospel and the lordship of Jesus Christ. And it seems so simple, like, I do, I already do this. I already, I already pray once a day, and I already open up my devotional once a day, and, you know, it seems so simple. Um, but it's actually extremely difficult, because what Paul is asking, what Paul is praying for, is not just the occasional prayer or the occasional devotion. It is the every day, every situation, every moment finding Christ and considering Him. And it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. And we can all sympathize together that it is extremely difficult. From Louise Spicer to my child, the saints and those new can sympathize together that this way of living is extremely difficult. And we ask ourselves, why is it so difficult? Well, let me ask another question. Why is dieting so difficult? Why are New Year's resolutions so difficult? Why are changing our habits so difficult? And the answer to each one of these questions is very simple. Very simple. And it's the same. We are weak. Spiritually, mentally, we are weak. And in a personal opinion, my personal opinion, okay, I'll step over here. I believe that 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 there's a correlation between our weakness and our love of power, okay? I was one of the 73 million people that tuned in on Tuesday night to watch the debate that was supposed to be a strong presentation of the amount of power that people have, that those two candidates had. We, if you were with me, um, you saw that that didn't happen. But that was the expectation, right? Right? We, we tuned in because we wanted to see the power from each side. We wanted to see who was going to lead us. We are obsessed with power. There's a whole group that are going through uh, downtown cities, and they're obsessed with power. They want, they're, they're very concerned. Our nation at the moment is very concerned with power. Why? Because we are weak together. We don't want someone to have too much, but they need enough so that we don't have it all. But we want some too so that they don't have too much. And we're not sure if it's a choice, if that's what power is, or we're not sure if it's law, is that what power is? And we're not sure if, that's, if it's money, is that what power is? Maybe all three together. But we want to know where and why and how power exists, and we want to have the power over power. Each and every one of us. And I think this is because we are unfortunately and extremely very weak. And Paul is pointing that out to the Ephesians. He says, I want you to grow. I keep asking God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and insight so that you may grow into disciplines of Christ. And he doesn't merely want it, he prays for them. He longs for them to have their eyes open. He calls it the glorious riches that they have in Christ. And then he says, the incomparably great power towards all those who believe. And that's how he ends verse 19. But look at what comes next. Look at what comes next in your Bibles. After verse 19, he lists all these three things. He says, I want you to have this, this, and this. What, what, what? And then what? And then what happens? Paul expounds the third thing that he asks for. Why this third thing? 
Why does he go in depth further into this third thing that he asked for, this power? He knows, he knows that power is important to accomplish the first two things. How do we grow? How do we change? Some say probably I'm already feeling super discouraged because I know that I'm weak already by myself. I've tried. I can't change my judgmental ways. I, I long to be free from my addiction to alcohol or images on the internet that I just, I just can't get rid of. I've tried. It happened. I've seen the doctor. The doctor's trying to help me. It, it's the closest that I've gotten. Well, I'll tell you why Paul goes even deeper into power. Why he wants to let you know even more about power. Because, my friend, we're about to look at hope this morning. We're about to look at hope and power that no mere man or woman can give to you. And let me show you this morning the power of God in His people, not to His people. This is no equation. It's not like, okay, I've done this, I've done this, and now I have power that was given to me from God. No, the power comes from within you. It's already placed at the moment of your salvation. You have power inside of you. And it belongs to those who exalt Christ to the highest place in their life. If that is not you this morning, I pray that it will become you. This message is entitled, The Exaltation of Christ, for that very, for that very reason. Is that each and every one of us, if, if we're already doing that, or if we have not yet done that, or exalt Christ to the highest place. I pray, I've prayed for you all week. I didn't, I didn't know what God wanted to say until really late last night, early this morning. But he's got a message for those who haven't exalted Christ to the highest place this morning. And it's found in verses 19 through 23. And let's read that together. It says, And, in, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only, is the present, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything and in every way. Father in heaven, we by ourselves are weak, but in Christ we are strong. Lord, teach us this morning. Help us to grab hold of this this morning, that we may see more of you and less of us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There are five ways here that we see the power of God at work in the life of Christ. First, we see that God raised Jesus from the dead Conquering death, verses 19 through 20. First, God defeated our ultimate enemy, death. Okay? At every which way, death tries to steal us away. Maybe even more so today, um, I think, because we have a culture that is so wrapped up in a fear of death. We're fearful of any kind of pain, any kind of distress that our bodies may un undergo, the trials that we're put through. We try so hard to make paradise here on earth with fancy contraptions and medicines. And, uh, but what happens if they don't work? We stress. We get anxiety. What, what happens if it's the worst case scenario this time? Consider with me 1 Corinthians 15. If you have your Bible, I want to flip over there. Um, 1 Corinthians 15. Death is an enemy that in Christ has already been crushed by God. Death has been swallowed up in the death of Christ. So we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 so that we can look at this together. If you don't have your Bible, that's fine. It will be up here on the screen. But I want to, it's important that we see this together. Starting in verse 54 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, that is, our bodies, 
the perishable, been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? And where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death, watch this, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, in our mortal bodies and in our mortal ways of thinking, we turn to politics or weapons or even gyms in order to manifest here on earth this power struggle. But what happens to a man when death is defeated, when there's no fear of death in man? It's hard for us to go into all nations and to baptize them in the name of of Jesus Christ and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them the ways of Jesus, to make them disciples, when we are scared that we might die. Death comes to every Christian. Death comes to every man. But the Christian is the only one safe. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the perishable becomes clothed with the imperishable, your spirit will live on forever in Christ. What hope and joy we have when we understand. Remember, this first chapter is about encouragement. Like, what could stop you on your mission of trying to serve the saints and grow disciples in your church? What could stop you? Paul is saying, be encouraged. And this is what he wants you to be encouraged by. Christ was exalted in power and in glory, meaning that he was raised up to the highest level. All the enemies made a footstool to him. We read Psalm 2 this morning. I have set my king over Zion. Death could not hold him. Satan could not touch him. He was lifted up and crushed all of his enemies. This is the moment where we say amen. I mean, amen. Like, before I move on, I just, amen. That's number two. The second way we see this power at work is that God seated Jesus at his right hand and gave us the same position. In verse 20, the the last part of verse 20, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. This idea is carried throughout the New and Old Testament, but is seen most clearly in Psalm 110. I want to read that for you, um, because it's much like Psalm 2, and it is the idea that, um, that go, that care, I mean, you hear Psalm 110, and you move through the rest of the New Testament, and you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. This was what they had Uh, in front of them. Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way. Meaning, this is so easy for him. And so he will lift his head high. That that put with Psalm 2, now reading this text from Paul, should give you an enlightened eyes to see that God has empowered installed Jesus as power over everything. He's installed him at the highest place. God the Father's right hand. He carries out judgment and forgiveness. I listened to uh, Pastor Sorensen's son, Chris, give a message from last Sunday. And I love how he began his sermon because he said... The same God that we like to think is all lovey-dovey, and he called him a marshmallow God. Lovey-dovey, because he, he hugs, and he's so sweet, and, and he loves me. And Yes, that God exists, but that same God promises wrath. 
promises judgment. That's the same God that opened the ground and swallowed up people for not obeying what he says. Like those two gods go together. He is one God, love and mercy, wrath and judgment. And in Christ, he has raised us up, Ephesians 2, 6 says, he has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. The power that we have in God, the power of God to the people in Christ is now through the resurrection. And that power is to live and to die for the glory of Christ. Whether it's going into all nations or plugging in where you are to live and to die for the glory of Christ. The power that took Jesus from death and exalted him eternally in God's presence put us there too and keeps us there. The third way that we see Jesus, uh, the power of God in Jesus' life is that God set Jesus over all demonic powers. In verse 21 he says, uh, God set Jesus far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is invoked, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. So at first read, we go, okay, over the president and over the United Nations and over you know, the, the dictators over there, and he set him above all those people. Well, who's influencing those people? If you flip, flip the page over to Ephesians chapter 2, you see that there is a prince of the power of the air. He's not so good. He controls the air. He is our adversary. And he speaks to us on a daily level, whether we like it or not. But in Christ, we have power over all demonic powers. Paul said in Colossians 2.15, that at the cross, God, quote, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Yes, he means political powers and kings, but even greater powers that work to control those earthly powers. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he was exalted over all the hosts of hell. Okay? That great adversary that tries to work against us to steal glory from God and to try to speak to you, to turn you from Christ has been triumphed over And in fact, in chapter 6 of Ephesians, we'll get to see how Paul says to fight. He says in Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Whether you like it or not, there's a war that is going on around you for your soul. And the encouragement from Paul is that in Christ, your soul is secure. If you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you. Right? We just read that. But if you confess your sin, he is faithful and merciful to forgive that sin. He stamps you with his seal. He says, mine, bought, glorified forever. The power from God is in us now for these daily battles, to live and to die for the glory of God. Christ. Now the fourth way we see uh, the power of God in Jesus is that God gave Jesus over as head of all things to the church. The fourth verse says in verse 22, uh, fourth, verse 22, it says, put all things under his feet and gave him as a head over all things to the church. He has been exalted above everything. Why? Because Colossians 1.16 says he created everything. He has been exalted over everything because he created everything. And as one commentator put it, the risen Jesus Christ is, quote, head over all things. Head implying authority and conscious, active rule over all history, all human beings, all demonic powers, disease, disability, all nature, weather, hurricanes, lightning bolts, tornadoes, volcanoes, 
earthquakes, floods, all businesses and industry, healthcare, sports, inventions, media, internet, military might, governments, presidents, kings, chiefs, religions, universities, solar systems, stars, galaxies, molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, and 10,000 other things that no man has yet discovered. Jesus is now head over them all, conscious, active ruler. We can rejoice with the psalmist that says, where can I escape your gaze? Even in the pits, even in the grave, I can't escape your eyes. You are there. It's not just power that exists in Jesus alone in heaven. He has given it to his church. Christ is glorified as the head through the body. This power in the resurrection is not just seen in life after death. It's supposed to be seen now. Right? It's the resurrection power now to live and die for the glory of Christ. To go into Providence. To go into Bargersville. To go into Franklin. To go into Greenwood. And to live a life for Christ boldly. As Romans 1.16 says, unashamed. We have so much fear of what other people may think of us when, when we pray or when we talk about our faith or when we might say that hell exists. Why? Why are we afraid of that? Why are we afraid to be a voice of that to our community? Because we're weak. The greatest news on the planet, the power of God unto salvation, is that if you confess Jesus Christ to be Lord, you're His. You're His. Forever. Sealed. It's done. He promises that power and that enlightenment and that that source of wisdom and insight in God forever. We confess that He is the only power that can save and that we need Him and that we want Him. You know, we fall on our knees and it's more than just praying a prayer. It's a cry. It's a cry. Lord, I need You. And Christians have Him. That's, that's, the exalt, that's, the, that's the encouragement to the saints, is that Christians have him, and they want him, and they cherish him. Above all, above all, so that they may have light. And you know that light can be seen by someone just sitting or walking in a room. The time that I spent with Luis, just gleaming. Why? She has the greatest treasure ever. She may have lost her second greatest treasure. She may not be able to be out and about. But she has the greatest treasure ever. And it can't put out her fire. No one, nothing can put out her fire. Because she has seen Christ. And she knows the power that Christ holds over sin and over Satan. Fifth. God gives his church joy in Christ. Verse 23 says, which is his body, the, so the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. It's hard to explain, but I pray for it every night that God would make me more joyful and that the joy that I have would seep over into my family and that my family would exude joy so that others might see Jesus comes to the believer in such a way, in such a power, that nothing fulfills their life more than him. No earthly joy can compete with Christ. Entertainment starts to lose its power. Numbing drinks and distracting foods lose their purpose when Christ is exalted to the highest place that he can be in your life. Nothing tastes as sweet as knowing that Jesus has work for you to do and that he is behind you as you do it. Jesus' words in John 10.10 was not, you know, I hear this all the time. The Christians are boring. You're living your life wrong. Because John 10.10 says, I have come so that they may have life. And life more what? Abundantly. Life more abundant. You start to see your family in a new light. No longer is your wife just your wife that you made a covenant to. But she is the one that you lead and that you love as Christ loves the church. 
No longer is your husband just your husband that you made a covenant to, but the one that you cherish and you follow and you cling to together in Christ. No longer are your kids just your kids, but they are your first disciples. No longer are your grandkids just grandkids to spoil. They're the next generation that you get to disciple. Even with friends, Christians tend to choose their friends in a more careful way than non-Christians. Why? Because everything in the life of a Christian either aids their mission or does not. And spending time surrounded by friends that bring you down or cause you to sin is not a life of joy. It's not a life of abundance. It's a life of defeat. You are to be a witness to those who are without Christ. You are. But it doesn't say that we have to surround ourselves with people that don't love Christ all the time. Choose your friends wisely. The church looks to enjoy Christ in all of life. All of life. It's what we said at the beginning. We want to learn and to grow and to have enlightenment so that every moment we see Christ in all of life. Everywhere we look, our goal is to find satisfaction and contentment and, and thanksgiving in Christ. So for the past two months, my daughter has developed a sleeping routine. She has a set of songs that her and mommy sing together before she's laid down every evening. We sing songs together as a family, but these are a special set of songs for her and mommy. Not her and daddy, mind you. <laughs> and one of those songs is Jesus Loves Me. You remember that song? Yep. It's a very basic song for children. But I wonder if we have forgotten the truths that are in it. Recall that line that says, I am weak, but he is strong. That sounds like a far cry from a modern way of thinking. Today, it's not so great to be weak. It's not a great thing to be weak. Our society tells boys, boys, you're strong in your body. You work to be strong. I mean, look at gym attendance. Look at sports teams. Why? Why have they grown? Our society tells little girls, Girls, you are strong and independent. You don't need anyone else. Be yourself. And to both of them, our society champions, like, waves the banner. You are strong and free and you can do whatever you want. But then we increase the anxiety medication and we increase the psychiatrist bill because our minds have grown fearful, we're afraid of man, and we're scared of seeming weak. No, no, that will not come from this pulpit. No, we've gotten it all wrong. We have missed it in a society as a church. We've gone along with a lie. We are weak. Because he is strong. I don't want to say that I'm strong because that's a lie. If the judge came down right now and looked at my sin, I'm guilty of hell. And some hate weakness. They try to get stronger in the world's terms. But then there are those that hate weakness and they try to cover it up with depression or, or, or sorrow as if there were no hope. So tell me, at the end of our lives, where are our muscles then? Where are our money? Where's our money then? Where's our independence then? How has that depression and sorrow served you? We can look strong on the outside. But on the inside, a human body is weak and fearful and afraid. I think Jesus told us to embrace our weakness and to take hold of the only power that saves men and women. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, 4, and 5, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Which means, who know that they need the Holy One. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is what? The kingdom of heaven. In verse 4, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? Mourn over their sin. 
for they will be comforted. In verse 5, blessed are the meek. And meek means submissive to the greatest authority. Blessed are those who are meek, who are submissive to the greatest authority, our Father in heaven, for they will inherit the earth. The power that we must grow to know much better and to recognize that every crush of sin, every temptation of sin, the power that we must take hold for the battle that we call life, is this immeasurable, or as our text says in the NIV, says the incomparable power of God that was displayed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What power it truly is to live and to die for the glory of Christ. You see, the war has been waged, and victory has been declared by the King of Kings. There is no victory for the other side. And the power for those that fight is Christ himself. There is hope, and it is Christ. We are weak, but he is strong. Father, I ask you for help, that we would understand this as a church, that our families would understand this, that that we would have ears to hear this message, and to, to take it back to our homes, and to consider it, and to chew on it, and to give our lives, to exalt you to the highest place. Lord, we can't do that without your power. We can't do that without you. We can't find true joy. We can't find true strength without you. So, Lord, come. I pray those hearts that you've been tugging on, Lord, that you would change them, that you would make them yours, that you would put that seal on their lives, and that you would help us go out into the world and live a life that is infectious for the love and power and glory and honor of Jesus Christ. I ask this in the name of my Savior. Amen.